Da 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 da! Welcome back! <laughs> Kathy Lee! Oh my god, this is the third freaking intro. Alright, let's start it one more time. <laughs> let's just. Hi, this is Kathy. You wanna, you wanna leave? <laughs> no, you can leave. You want me to leave? Okay. <laughs> this is video number two yes, where I'm gonna be telling Kathy. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Lead, like because you're just gonna keep getting poop. up. <laughs> you freaking kidding me right now. I don't hear you pooping fast enough. Okay, hi, hi, welcome back. Welcome back to our channel. My name is Celeste, my name is Kathy, and today Celeste is going to be telling me a story, a mystery story. So, buckle in, go get your coffee, and get ready to hear an amazing story. So today, I'm going to be telling you guys about the East Doll Woman. Have you ever heard of that? Mm -mm. Yeah, so I found this story a while ago, but when I came across it, I just thought it was really interesting because there's a lot of mysteries and unanswered questions. Ooh. And there have also been recent developments in the recent years. Ooh. So videos that I found online, there was a lot of information, but a lot of the videos didn't include updated information. So I thought that it would be cool to make a new video and just include some of the newer developments. Yes. So just to paint the scene. Paint it. You're in Bergen, Norway. <gasps> You're hiking this beautiful mountain. There's trees everywhere. There's a lake at the bottom of the valley. This area is known as Ice Valley or East Ellen or Death Valley. Oh, why yeah. Death Valley? So the reason why it was referred to Death Valley, refer, is that how you Referred to as? Referred to as Death Valley is because there had been a lot of recent accidents, like hiking accidents in the area. Also in the medieval times, that was like a hot spot where, not a hot spot, <laughs> It was a spot where people would go to commit suicide. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Which I found that pretty interesting too because I didn't really think about the fact that people commit suicide back in the day. But obviously they did. But I just never really thought about it. I mean, I've never heard it to be talked about. You know? Yeah. And I think a big reason why that is or why I thought that it wasn't a, a thing. thing. Yeah. It was because it was obviously looked down upon, you know. So it probably wasn't mm. talked about very much. Because of like religion and whatever yeah but yeah so you're hiking through this beautiful area you know it as death valley or ice valley it's really gorgeous and all of a sudden you come across a really stinky smell <gasps> smells like something is burning but not something like a campfire <gasps> yeah this is Ice Valley. Oh, wow. That's gorgeous. Yeah, it's stunning. Which I'm like, I would love to go there, but yeah. now knowing what I know, I don't know. I'm a little scared. But yeah. Probably so, haunted. Yeah, probably. But yeah, so that's basically exactly what happened. On November 29th in 1970, a man and his two young daughters were hiking in Ice Valley, and his daughters are just 10 and 12 years old, and one of the daughters smells like a weird smell, so... She follows the smell. I couldn't figure out if it was the 10 year old or the 12 year old, but either way, like that's way Still too really young. young. Yeah. Yeah, to like discover anything. But yeah, she came across the body of the East Doll woman, her burned remains. And so she told her dad, and they did what anybody else would do. They went straight to the police. Mm -hmm. However, this was in the 1970s, so it's not like they had cell phones. They couldn't just, like, call the cops, and the cops would come. Mm -hmm. um, they had to, like, hike back to town and Jeez. then tell the cops, yeah. And then call them from there. Yeah, exactly. So who knows how much time passed between, like, them going to call the cops and whatever because it didn't I couldn't find any information on how far they were into the hike but I do know that they were off trail oh okay. so they weren't like on a specific trail which I thought that was interesting as well like why are mm -hmm. you taking your two young kids off trail yeah hiking I guess maybe he was an expert but yeah it's kind of weird dang but yeah so the cops respond as quickly as they're able and they get to the scene and again the first thing that the cops notice <laughs> It's just a mailman. 
But yeah, so the police arrive to the scene and the first thing that they notice, much like the young girl, is the smell of a charred body. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Before they even see the body, they can smell it. Ew. I imagine? Oh, I know. It's so gross. Ew. Being the ones that are like, in charge of having to go see what that is, like... Oh gosh, I feel like I would just want to run the other way. Oh my gosh, I know. And imagine the dad. Like, now he has two traumatized children, most yeah. likely. They'll probably never... They'll be like, see, this is why we don't go off trail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the last living police officer says that there was a campfire at the crime scene. However, there are no police reports at all that say that there was a campfire or any remnants of a campfire. The only thing that they said that was on fire was her actual body. So that's kind of suspicious. That wouldn't even make sense because it's like how she how would she be on fire without a campfire? Yeah, unless somebody lit her on fire. Oh. That's what the last living police officer said and he's still alive yeah. to this day and he's commented on this and <gasps> this is just hearsay and i just want to make that clear because i don't want like the bergen police coming for me but basically a lot of them said that they weren't happy with the conclusion of the case oh. so that's kind of interesting this wow. police officer i don't think there's anything wrong with him i think it's more the police files why wasn't there more information if he says that there were remnants of a campfire why wasn't that notated you know it's just yeah, kind of real and it's not like he was the only one that showed up yeah exactly and that's actually what they thought happened and according to police accounts and stuff they thought mm -hmm. that she just went up there and she lit a fire and she fell in and burned to death like she had an oh. accident so if he's saying that there was a campfire why is it not in the police records you know like if that's what the story that they're going with why wouldn't she have a fire that she supposedly fell into right also i would like to mention that because this case takes place in norway it could be that there was a translation issue with the information on like wikipedia or something oh because it's in norwegian yeah, so still to this day, nobody knows how long she was there. No one knows if somebody did something to her or what. There is a lot of compelling evidence that supports the fact that somebody did this to her. Or she may have done it to herself. And I'm gonna read through some of these parts because I don't want to leave anything out. Mm -hmm. But this is exactly what the police found. They found the front of her body and her clothes have been severely burned. She was found in a boxer's pose, which is a pose that is common for victims, like burn victims. Usually they'll be found like this. Mm -hmm. And according to the police, she was nearly unrecognizable. And then just before I go into the other details of what was found, it was mentioned that her appearance was very unlike typical Scandinavian features, blonde hair and blue eyes. Mm. She had brown hair, brown eyes, mm. which was a lot less common in the area during that time. Mm. So also placed or located near the body and affected by the fire. And these items are so random, which I'm like, it kind of makes you think that this was intentional, but I'll just go through and list the items. An empty bottle of liquor, two reusable plastic water bottles, and the police checked to see if there was any petrol or gasoline in them, and there wasn't. There had only been water inside. There was a plastic passport container, rubber boots that were not on her but beside her, a wool sweater, a scarf, nylon stockings, an umbrella, a purse, a matchbox, a watch that was set to 10 10 a.m., which is usually what watches are set to in a store before they're sold. Hmm. So they were like, was the watch never used? Was it brand new? Or was this like some symbolic of something yeah yeah that's so random too it's yeah and then there were two earrings a finger ring and the jewelry and the watch were found beside her body as if they had been placed there so some people speculate that that might have been some kind of ritual if she did commit suicide maybe she put her things next to her maybe her valuable things she wanted next to her or i don't know and then there was a small ring like a little tiny ring that was most likely used to hold a passport in place and then around her body were traces of burned paper which people also speculate that that could have been like her passport that had been oh, burned yeah. like around her did she do it did somebody else do it what the heck at first there was no petrol found on the scene no cans of gasoline or anything like that and the thing that drew me to this case was I had heard a story that was kind of similar to this and you actually heard it too but all of the identifying marks and labels on her clothes and all the items around her had been removed or rubbed off so her clothing tags were completely removed labels were all rubbed off yeah I, I thought that was kind of weird yeah, that's so weird. I, I remember we either heard a podcast with this or watched a show together with yeah, something show. like that. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. Different story. Different but, story, but similarities. But similarities. And that I'll, is so weird. Yeah, and I'll do a deep dive into that story as well. Not like a deep dive. A very light dive. Light dive. Yeah, so who was she? Somebody must have known who she was. She was in this area, you know? Yeah. Who was this woman who didn't really look like she was from the area? Yeah. Somebody must have seen her. Like, did they see her hiking? Did she get a ride there? I checked and from the Bergen Railway Station, that's where she must have been coming from. Mm -hmm. It was an hour hike to where she was found, where her body was found, or a 15-minute drive. Mm -hmm. So she either was, like, driven there or she hiked. But I'm like, that's kind of a long way for nobody to see you if she did walk. Yeah, especially with all those random items. Yeah. Like, she was not traveling lightly. Yeah. It's like, how was she carrying all that stuff as well? Did she just carry it on her own? I don't know. Yeah, and it's like, if she had done that to herself, then wouldn't there be a suitcase with all of her stuff? How... You wouldn't just carry all that with you. Like, yeah. It's like you would have something to put Or with in. somebody with her carrying it for her. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. And, well, yeah. I'll let you tell your story. But I, so far, I feel like she didn't do it herself to her. That's what I think, too. <laughs> yeah. So, 1970, the police have her body. They send her in to have an autopsy. The autopsy does come back a little while later. Like, I think a few days. Mm-hmm. When it does come back, they find an unexplained bruise on the right side of her neck. And then they also mentioned that it could have been the result of a blow or a fall. So if somebody (gasps) punched her or maybe she fell. But I'm like, how do you fall on your neck like that? Yeah, like that. There are no signs that she had ever been ill. Like, not ever, but recently. (laughs) Like when when she died. Like she wasn't ill with anything. Yeah, the autopsy also finds that she had never been pregnant or had a child. There were smoke particles in her lungs, Mm -hmm. which mean that she was most likely alive while she was burning. Oh, that's like one of my worst fears. Oh my gosh, I know. It's like that That question that's always like, would you rather burn to death or drown to death? Yeah, it's like, why do I have to choose that? Yeah, it's like both would really suck. Both would really suck. That really sucks that she died that way yeah like that she was aware that she was being burned yeah they also found a high concentration of carbon monoxide in her bloodstream which is common when you burn to death experts also found that there were 50 to 70 sleeping pills in her stomach that she had taken shortly before she died because they weren't fully dissolved into her bloodstream yet. So Damn, so that means she was conscious. Yeah, she was most likely conscious. Oh. And it's kind of like, did somebody force her to take those in case she survived? I don't know, but it was from a foreign brand called Phenomol, which is a barbiturate. I wanted to mention that because there's a detail that comes in a little bit later. Bar- Barbiturate. 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 Yeah. Okay. And under her body, they found a fur hat with traces of petrol on it. And they also found that there was petrol in the ground below her body, which means that petrol had likely been used to set her on fire. But Um, magically, the container of the petrol just wasn't found only under her. Exactly. Yeah. And again, like no cans of petrol were on the scene, so pretty sketchy i feel like that to me says everything yeah you know obviously yeah. not a suicide yeah forensics found her to be about 5'4 with dark brown hair brown eyes around face with small ears and slim generous hips <laughs> <laughs> slim generous hips yeah they just wanted to include that so slim generous i don't know why they put that but whatever <laughs> um <laughs> she had also had extensive dental work 14 fillings including unusual gold crowns and root canals gold yeah the police released this information to the press hoping that somebody will come forward and say something but they never got word from anybody wow. and because they couldn't identify her of course that's when police refer to her as the east Stall woman mm. so she's the east Stall woman now and the newspapers are talking about this because in norway during this time they especially because it was november so it was really cold they wouldn't get a whole lot of tourists in the area they did have more tourists in the summertime but for the most part in the winter it was a lot less common so yeah because people generally want to travel to somewhere hot during the winter yeah so they had tourists but just not a lot so word spread really quickly yeah Um, people became aware of this case really fast and because of that her 
first suitcases were actually found at Bergen Railway Station, <gasps> which like I said is about an hour walk or a 15 minute drive from where she was found. Oh my god. Basically back in the day when you would go to a railway station, they used to have lockers. I think some still have lockers where you just put your stuff. Uh-huh. But during the 1970s at the Bergen Railway Station, they had a check-in system where you would check your bags in. Like if you wanted to go and explore the town or something, you oh. could just check your bags in and leave them there and then just pay per day. So they would just hold them in the bag for you or something? Yeah, they had a little ticketing system where they would put it in a locker for you basically. Oh, okay. Yeah, so she left her bags there and they called the police and they were like, hey, yeah, we have her stuff. So the police went and got in. What was in there? So I'll read through this as well because there's a lot of stuff I don't want to leave out. Yeah. In the suitcases, the police discovered Dutch, Norwegian, Belgian, British, and Swiss currency. They found super fancy clothes, shoes, wigs, makeup, eczema cream, spoons, masks. Spoons? Yeah. Timetables. Yeah, wigs, makeup. What are timetables? It was like a chart that would show the arrival and departure times of trains, planes, Buses. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay. there was a pair of glasses with non prescription lenses, sunglasses with partial fingerprints that matched the body, cosmetics like lotion and stuff, a notepad, and as with the body, most identifying information had been removed, such as labels and tags. Oh, and like of the purses and stuff? Yeah, like the purses, the makeup, like it would, like. Oh, the brand of makeup? Yeah, it was just like <gasps> rubbed off. Yeah, I don't know how, but yeah, everything was just rubbed off. For the most part, there were no identifying labels or marks on anything to me it sounds like somebody really went out of their way to hide who she was where she came from and it's like she you said she had stuff from like norway um Belgium, but it's like I had imagined that that type of makeup is available all across Europe, you know? So yeah. it's like, why would you go out of your way to? I mean, we know why because they were obviously trying to hide something, but I don't know, it seems, seems a bit extra. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing is like, that's why this information is important to the police because having identifying marks and labels rubbed off makes it harder for them to identify her. Yeah. Because her clothes were so fancy, nice materials and stuff. Yeah. They were most likely designer. And if they were designer, they could have located where the item came from. Oh, yeah. Along with, you know, like her makeup and stuff. So, yeah. And then, like I mentioned, she had a uh, tube of eczema cream and even the prescription was rubbed off of that which would have contained all of her personal information including oh, her yeah. first and last name where her she doctor got it. yeah yeah and that was rubbed off too you were smart with this yeah just by looking at this information at least to me the first thing that i thought of was she's either hiding from something or she's a spy mm. she has disguises you know like all the wigs, wigs and stuff but even like tourists it wouldn't really make sense for somebody to be carrying that kind of stuff you know yeah. i don't think that you yourself would go in and hide your prescriptions eczema cream like where it came from yeah. and all that information you know it's like, it's like who are you worried about seeing that but at this point please think that this is all like her own doing that she was the one who chose to hide this information wow one important item in the investigation was actually the notepad because it mm-hmm. wasn't just like an average notepad like a diary or something it was a notepad that contained codes <gasps> Codes. Which I love codes, oh. yeah. But yeah, so one of the codes was 20M, 23MO, just to give an idea. And the police sent it to a military intelligence service to try to see if they could crack the codes and figure out what that means. Uh-huh. And we'll get into that a little more, but pretty cookie. A code, it's like, if that doesn't scream spy to you, I don't know what does. Freaking yeah. codes. Why would, why would you be traveling and not have it be like a diary, you know? Like, today I went to... You know, da, 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 da. like yeah. Today I went so hiking weird. and that was so much fun. It's like no, yeah. just a book full of codes. Hmm. For some she was <laughs> Yeah, it's like, what is going on? After that, the items that they used to further their investigation were items that did not have the labels removed, which was amazing. And one of the items that they found was a matchbox with a label on it, and it came from Beat Use, an erotic postal order service in Germany. Wait, Um, an erotic postal order service? Like Sexy Melman? In 1970, yeah. No, not sexy underwear. (laughs) According to reports, it was where they could order sexy underwear, like lingerie. Oh. Yeah. I did some research of my own because I was like, I want to know everything about this. (laughs) 
Like, who wouldn't? Yeah. And I couldn't find any other videos or online articles that talked about this specifically, so I wanted to include mm. it. But now it's a chain of sex shops in Germany and across Europe. It's kind of interesting that out of all the labels that were removed, this one was left on. You and said it was a matchbox with this name on it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And especially considering how uncommon stuff like this would be in yeah. the 1970s, it's kind of interesting to think that she left that on specifically. Yeah. But yeah, so I I did my research on this and Beatus Rotermund was one of the very few female stunt pilots in Germany in the 1930s, which is so cool. Oh, wow. Yeah, and that was after World War II and then she started the very first sex shop in the world. She was a huge controversy like everywhere she went. Like, if, Wow. I would recommend looking this girl up because oh. it's a wild ride and it's she so sounds interesting. She amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, her story is extremely interesting. Yeah. And according to Wikipedia, she sold condoms and books on marital hygiene, not laundry. So oh. I'm not really sure. It might be a translation issue. Oh, yeah. And this will come into the story a little bit later, but Beat was Russian and lived in Germany. So just keep oh, that okay. in mind. Okay. So was there a reason why she left this matchbox in there? I don't know. <laughs> but it kind of seems to me like maybe she kept it as a souvenir or something, you know? Yeah. And they also find a plastic bag from Oscar Rodvet's mm. footwear store in Germany. Mm. And they decided to focus on this while investigating other leads, such as the military intelligence service trying to crack the codes. So they went over to Stavanger, which is also in Norway. And Stavanger is where this foot store was at. Mm. And the police find by looking at her tickets that she had been and stayed in Stavanger at least two times. She stayed in two hotels there. And after tracking her movements, they actually found that she had been all over Norway. They go to this footwear store and the owner of the shoe store Stun, um, mm. shoe stores Stun. <laughs> But yeah, Rolf Rodbet remembers selling a pair of rubber boots to a very well-dressed, nice-looking woman with dark <gasps> hair. Oh, was yeah. it the rubber boots that were found with yeah. her? Oh, yeah. Bro. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so and they... This, okay. This is their, you know, one of their biggest leads so far. They're, like, obviously really happy that they came across this. And Yeah. So they start talking to him, and again, the boots that he sold to her appear to match the boots that were found on the body or near the body in East Ellen. Wow. And police believe that the umbrella that was found near her body was also bought from this store. He said that she had made an impression on him because she took a really long time choosing her boots, much longer than the average customer. Oh. In fact, she didn't even buy the boots until the next day. So he was like kind of interested by that. Obviously, again, she didn't have typical Scandinavian features, so he did notice her. She stuck out more than most people mm-hmm. and he also noticed that she spoke english but with an accent that was non-norwegian she had initially oh. tried on the boots and they didn't fit so he went to get her another size mm-hmm. and when he did that she shouted at him in a language that was not english he said it could have been german or french mm. so was she rude i don't think so oh okay she was just really indecisive yeah i think she was just indecisive oh i wonder what she was yelling at him when she I think because he, like, went downstairs, so maybe he, like, couldn't hear her. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Or, like, into another room, maybe, so she, like, shouted kind of, like, like hey. politely, like, hey, sorry. Do a green one. Green ones, please. That hey, yeah, be, maybe yeah. that. Yeah, I don't know. For sure. He also recalls that she had a strong smell em- emanating from her. Emanating? Emanating from her. That smelled like garlic. Oh, yeah. garlic people. Yeah, me and Kathy, we used to work at a hotel in Zion National Park where we were housekeepers and when people would leave the room, sometimes there would be this like really strong smell and it took us a little while to figure out what the <laughs> smell was, but we found out that it's the smell of garlic people. So I know yeah. exactly what he's talking about when I know he exactly. says that. Yeah. And emanating from the We're woman. garlic girls too. Yeah. You know, it's like no hate. Yeah. We, it's very yeah. uh, potent. It's very potent. Yeah. And like after, you know, you eat garlic, it's just a very funky smell, you know? <laughs> and using his description, the police are able to trace her to a hotel nearby where she stayed and checked in as Fenella Lork from Belgium. So completely just random name um this is probably a stupid question but is belgium a country yeah okay no no belgium germany belgium germany yeah okay i think 
Maybe we should jump. It's like, I'm sorry, I don't know. World. It's like, I'm sorry, I went to public school. Belgium. Germany. Oh, it's a country. In Europe. It's a in country. Europe. Okay, Belgium okay. is a country. <laughs> Belgium is a country. <laughs> she checked in as Vanilla Lork from Belgium. And this was um, at a hotel nearby the shoe store? Yeah. So basically, for the first time, they have a name for her. Vanilla Lork. They're like, yes, this is great. Now we can just solve the case. We can go home. It's all done. We can tell our family. And then they're just, you know, trying to close up the case by finding more information. Yeah. And the hotel's receptionist said that she had seen a woman check in who matched the description of the East Elwood. Woman, and the receptionist described her as soft-spoken and private. She wore a fur hat and she spoke with a lisp and she had gold in her teeth. The receptionist also noted that there was a small gap between her front teeth. Oh, cute. The East Elf woman stayed in the hotel from November 9th to the 18th mm-hmm. and then she left Stavanger on the 18th. Oh, okay. So that's probably when Stavanger. she arrived in Bergen. Bergen. And both of these places are in Norway, huh? Um, yes. And so when they checked the hotels in Bergen, they couldn't find anyone by the name of Vanilla Lord or Lork. So they thought that they had an identity for her. But mm -hmm. then when they checked the hotels in Bergen, they can't find anybody by that name. So after doing some more thorough searching, they find out that she had at least eight names that she was going by when she was staying in places throughout Norway. Eight? Yeah. And several people, including employees at these hotels, did remember her. Like I said, she didn't have typical Scandinavian features. So when people saw her, she stood out, you know. She stood out, yeah. And also, not just the way that she looked physically, but also, well, I guess the way she looked physically but yeah her attire you know she had like fancy, fancy clothes she like had really pretty dark hair a really pretty face generous hips you know <laughs> <laughs> Basically, she was a hottie walking around and everybody was like, oh my gosh. So the police are going around and they're like, you know what? We gotta find some more information about this girl because we were wrong about everything. Yeah, I mean, clearly. And so they try to talk to more hotel staff, like at different hotels to see what they can find. And one of these interactions took place at the Neptune Hotel in Bergen, where she checked in as Alexia Zarn Marquez from Ljubljana. Mm -hmm. And this was from October 30th to November 5th, so well before Stavanger. Oh. So she was in Bergen, and then she went to Stavanger, and then she went back to Bergen. Oh, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. And it's pretty apparent that she was going back and forth quite a bit, Uh but I'll get into that a little later. Okay. But this hotel staff that had seen her, her name was Alvild Rangnes. She was a 21-year-old waitress at the Hotel Neptune at the time. And she said that her first impression of the East Isle woman was one of elegance and self-assuredness. She said that mm. she looked super fashionable. And so she was like kind of staring at her because she was just like, oh my gosh, she's stunning. Mm. And she's so cool. Like yeah. she looks so cool, you know? Ooh, yeah, like just the way she carried herself, her outfit. Yeah, everything. her outfit. Which I completely understand because that's happened yeah. to me so many times where I see beautiful older women and I'm just like... Yeah, yeah. you're just like, dang, I want to be just like you i want to be just like you maybe date you Mm. maybe you know Mm. i don't know she said that she looked fashionable and quote i wished to be able to mimic her style in fact i remember her winking at me Uh from my perspective it felt as though she thought that i had been staring a bit too much at her (laughs) that's cute i'm gonna do my eyeliner really quick okay so i'm gonna have to pause talking okay (laughs) because it's too hard to talk and do eyeliner She also said on one occasion that while she was serving the East Isle woman, she was in the dining hall mm-hmm. and she said that she was sitting right next to but not interacting with two German Navy personnel. She was sitting right next to them but she wasn't interacting with them? Like yeah. Like she wasn't talking to them? No. Huh. In a dining hall, kind of like a cafeteria? Yeah, kind of like, you know how when hotels have like a restaurant? Oh, okay. Like downstairs, like the like fancy fancy hotels will sometimes have like a little restaurant area where you can like order food and coffee in the morning and stuff. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, wow, that's so weird. I wonder why they weren't talking. Yeah, I was like, huh. That's kind of sketchy. Uh, yeah. So the police question several hotel staff that met and spoke to the East Isle woman, including Alvild, and they learned that in addition to speaking English, the woman also used a lot of German phrases, which going back to a, a little bit ago, beat use, she was, well, she lived in Germany and she was from <coughs> Russia. Yeah. So I'm like, was that, is there a connection there? Was she maybe, uh. is the East Isle woman, does, you know? 
Anyways, yeah, we'll get a little Was she getting, that. like, inspiration for her different identities from BU's? Or maybe she was just a big fan, and she was yeah. like, you're from Germany, I'm from Germany. I'm from Germany, you're a bad baby. They also learned that she often requested a change of room, and on one occasion, she asked to change rooms three times. And police used the check-in forms in hotels to figure out where she had stayed in Norway, Mm -hmm. um, like I said. And um, like I said as well, (laughs) she had at least eight names that she was going by, which means that she had multiple passports that she was using. Passports at the time were required to check into hotels. Wow. So she had at least eight names, which means she must have had at least eight passports. And it's like back then, I bet like forging passwords was probably a lot harder than it is now. I mean, not to say that it's easy, but I feel like... (laughs) yeah that screams spy to me like how else would you have access to that or unless some kind of like top secret government military agency like gave you that or what you know Exactly. They end up getting back with the military intelligence service and by oh, using yeah. her handwriting, they were able to track her movements leading up to her death. And oh. they were able to basically match the handwriting to the codes in the book. This is what they found. I'll go ahead and just read through. Genevieve Lancier from Louvain stayed in the Viking Hotel Oslo from the 21st to the 24th of March, 1970. So this is way before her body was found. Mm-hmm. And then they also found Claudia Tielt from Brussels stayed in Hotel Bristol Bergen from the 24th to the 25th in March. They also found that she stayed the same under the same alias from Brussels in Hotel Scandia Bergen from the 25th of March to the 1st of April. Mm. So if you notice, she's in Oslo, then Bergen, and then under the same name but a different last name, Claudia Nielsen from Ghent stayed in KNA Hotelette Stavanger from the 29th to the 30th of October. As we mentioned before, Alexia Zarn Marquez from Ljubljana stayed in the Neptune Hotel in Bergen from the 30th of October to the 5th of November. Whoa. So this is the month that her body was found, November. Vera Jarl from Antwerp stayed in Hotel Bristol, Trondheim from the 6th to the 8th of November. Vanilla Lork stayed in St. Svithun Hotel in Stavanger from the 9th to the 18th that's in November. Where, that's the first one they found, huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Miss Lienhofer stayed in Hotel Rosenkranz Bergen from the 18th to the 19th in November and then Elizabeth Lienhofer from Ostend stayed in Hotel Hordenheim in Bergen <laughs> from the 19th to the 23rd of November. So hopefully wow. my pronunciation is okay. I'm like trying to do my best for these European names and cities but I think you sound very European. Yeah so basic thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah anyways. So like I said a ton of back and forth like she's in Stavanger, Bergen, Stavanger, Bergen, Stavanger. It's like why are you going back and forth and also Honestly. how did nobody notice her? Yeah it's she, like she has she wear these, different wings or what? Exactly if she has these amazing identifying features dark mm-hmm. hair, dark eyes, generous hips like <laughs> why didn't somebody like see her? It's because yeah. she was probably wearing disguises, wearing yeah. different kinds of makeup, wigs, maybe her non-prescription glasses, maybe sunglasses Mm -hmm. you know her hats her fancy clothes you know so the code book so because they were able to use handwriting analysis to match the names on the hotel check-in forms and cross-reference them with the codes they determined that the codes indicated dates and places that the woman had stayed and they were able to match it up with everything that i just said like the names the hotels the oh so the code that i gave earlier was 20 m 23 m o which stood for march 20th to the 23rd oslo so just as an example that's like how the codes were written out why the police at this point they're like this is kind of this is this story is heating up clearly we are dealing with something completely different yeah and so they printed a sketch of her and released it to the norway media to see if anybody would come forward saying that they had seen her but literally no one did and this is the sketch that they came out with it looks like a cartoon yeah it looks like a cartoon so maybe they just didn't have the resources at the time to get like a professional sketch artist 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 involved So even though some of the staff at hotels said that they had seen her with different men on several occasions, literally no men came forward to say that they had seen her based off of her description or this picture, which they're like, somebody must have seen her. Somebody must have known her. Was she visiting someone here? You know, like it's just kind of interesting. If she was with all these men, why didn't 
one man come forward, you know? Yeah. But yeah, so on November 18th, this was the day that she left Stavanger to go back to Bergen. Mm -hmm. There was a maid who had gone into the East Stall woman's room to do turndown service, which is basically Mm -hmm. where you make the bed, make it all nice, take out the trash. She found the East Stall woman with a man (gasps) and the maid apologized. Like romantically or what? He was just like sitting by the window at a like a little table and then the East Stall woman was sitting on the bed. Oh, so they were like apart okay. from each other. They weren't like really talking. It seemed like maybe they were whispering before the lady came in. And oh. then when she came in, they went completely silent. <gasps> the maid was like, I'm so sorry. I didn't know that you were in here. I was just coming to do turn down service. Yeah. And neither of them said a word to her. <gasps> So were they in a fight or was, oh. were they just rude? I don't know. Oh my god, That's awkward. Sounds like she interrupted like a more intense conversation to me. Yeah, maybe a secretive conversation. Yeah, top secret military. Yeah. And as you remember at the Hotel Neptune, the waitress, Alvild Rangnes, <laughs> she had seen the woman with two German Navy personnel. Yeah. But she wasn't talking to them. Yeah. So there was a bunch of strange behavior that the East Al woman had at these hotels where <gasps> she would be found with men but she wouldn't be talking to them or in this case at the hotel neptune a maid said that she found a table that was flipped upside down inside the room in front of the door sorry so the table in front of the door kind of like when you're like putting it under so that like if somebody tries to open it from the other end you can't get in yeah basically yeah how did they get in then from another door my guess is maybe it was there so that if somebody came in they she would hear a noise oh yeah yeah so that she would be alerted and i'm mm-hmm. guessing also that the table is probably pretty dainty that it oh, could be yeah. moved easily yeah and then at hotel horda hyman the last hotel that she stayed mm-hmm. she would go down every morning and pay for breakfast that was not included because it wasn't included it was actually a lot more expensive so Ooh. she would have to kind of pay a lot she's like paying for her room and she's paying for breakfast every morning it's like it's not cheap you know so they're like she's rich yeah (laughs) and every single day she would have her do not disturb sign on as well Hmm. and one day one of the maids was like walking in the hallway Mm -hmm. and there was an armchair in front of the door in the hallway in front of her hotel room that's odd yeah so again maybe so that she would be alerted or maybe to keep somebody out i don't know and with all of this suspicious behavior and possible foul play bergen police stopped the investigation and decided to chalk it up to suicide. What? To me, it sounds like somebody told them to stop investigating. Because it's like so much evidence, so much mystery, the codes, eight different aliases, the eyewitnesses that interacted with her. Like there was so much there. Exactly. Why did they... <sighs> That's stupid. Yep. Wow. The case is closed and they decide to bury her in February 1971. So they hadn't even investigated it for two, three months. Wow. She died at the end of November 1970. And then she was buried in February 1971. So literally like two months later. And the police think that she might have been Catholic. So they organized a Catholic funeral for her. The coffin was decorated with lilacs and tulips. And the priest conducted a simple ceremony for her. And the police still hope to find the woman's family. So she's buried in a zinc coffin that won't decompose oh wow and they keep an album of photos from the funeral for her relatives just in case Mm -hmm. and because of the death in ice valley podcast the story grew in popularity and the case was reopened so (gasps) that was amazing that was in 2000 or yeah 2017 18 oh wow so that was really cool that they were able to reopen it that like obviously helps a lot you know so it was a whole podcast dedicated to this case yeah and i listened to a lot of it to help me learn more about this case and Mm. if you guys are interested i would highly recommend it it's from nrk NRK. yeah bbc is amazing so if you like bbc stuff and you like british procedurals Mm. you would definitely like that podcast so now it's time to jump into the developments the first thing is they never found the taxi driver who took the east doll woman to the bergen railway station but Mm. in 1991 so several years later a man who asked to remain anonymous said that he had taken her to the station (gasps) and that an unknown man had joined them (gasps) 
And why didn't he come forward before then? Yeah, and why did he want to remain anonymous? I'm like, what the heck? Yeah. And in 2005, a Bergen resident had told a local newspaper that after he saw the sketch of her, he suspected that he had seen her hiking just five days before her body was found. Oh, wow. Yeah, and he said that he was really surprised at her clothes because she wasn't wearing hike typical hiking gear. She was in her fancy clothes. Mm-hmm. And he said that he remembers that she was with two men. Mm-hmm. And he thought that it was kind of weird because she came up to him and she was acting like she was gonna say something and then she didn't and she just walked away oh my god i wonder what she was gonna say i know but he said that he reported it to the police and they didn't take his sighting seriously at all and they told him to forget about it so that's to great. forget about it what for what reason why yeah and then like i said in 2016 2017 2018 the case starts to get more traction it basically gets reopened and the nrk commissioned the american artist Stephen missile to create six alternative sketches of the east all woman which were shown to people that had seen her so <gasps> they went back to like the hotels and stuff rolf redfort um the son red rolf Ward Vets uh, footwear short store and they talked to the son and they showed him that as well these sketches oh wow wow she looks so like serious and just beautiful beautiful and mysterious yeah yeah they go around and they show everybody the sketches hoping that somebody will have more information Mm -hmm. and at her autopsy in 1970 her teeth and her jaw were removed because of her unique gold fillings they were basically hoping that they could conserve her jaw and her teeth and maybe later on down the line somebody would be able to help identify her giselle bang a professor of dentistry he was the one that kept the woman's jaw in hopes that other experts would recognize the dental work and after his death everyone assumed that the jaw had been completely destroyed mm-hmm. forensic doctor inge morald who inherited the east all woman files said that the jaw had been thrown away because it was smelling bad because it smelled bad it was preserved it wouldn't smell bad i mean yeah. unless you like opened the jar exactly why would you throw away evidence ever you never know what you might be able to find later you know yeah if it smells bad put it in a, another jar yeah and it's like was there a reason why this was thrown away you know yeah. but in 2018 after the investigative journalists at nrk keep making queries about the east all woman mm-hmm. professor morald finds the jaw deep in a cellar at hawkland university hospital hospital's forensic archives which is like a warehouse so the find gives the norwegian police the opportunity to reopen the case like i said they're able to use the latest forensic techniques to try and identify the woman Uh the tests involve an oxygen isotope analysis which can reveal the type of water that she drank when she grew up and which areas the water came from and then there was yeah it's so cool i didn't even know that existed yeah it's pretty because i think it's pretty new yeah and then a strontium isotope analysis which can reflect the types of food that she ate and what type of soil it was grown in and what area that would be like what area she grew up basically yeah and by the testing they were able to determine that she was about 45 years old when she had passed Mm. and that she had been from an area in germany called nuremberg and that in her teens she moved west (laughs) they also determined that the gold in her teeth also pointed to her being from germany where financial assistance was offered for gold fillings i guess that financial assistance for gold fillings in other countries wasn't as accessible Mm -hmm. like in the uk for example Mm -hmm. assistance like this wasn't offered for dental work of this kind so it must have been from somewhere in like eastern europe like germany or something like that Mm. and handwriting analysis also found that she may have been a natural born french speaker and that fits because witnesses stated that she didn't speak german as if it were her first language and the guy in the footwear store rolf he said that she yelled at him in a language that sounded like french or german yeah so huh i wonder this part just trips me out Mm -hmm. because i couldn't find anything else about this i couldn't find that anybody else had spoken about this this man is from france and he in 2019 claimed to have had a relationship with her in the summer of 1970 which kind of fits because from april all the way to october she was oh, unaccounted yeah. there for was, yeah wow but yeah he could have just said that because of the traction that was happening on this case at the time because this was after um the nrk after. the nrk had like gone in and you know had all this information about it but mm-hmm. he said that she 
pretended to be about 26 years old, but she often dressed herself up to look a lot younger. And she refused mm. to share any kind of personal information with him, which mm. he found kind of strange. And he said that she often received scheduled phone calls from abroad. And he managed to rifle through all of her belongings and found various wigs and car- like a bunch of like colorful fancy clothes. And he also pilfered a photograph of the woman riding a horse. He thought about contacting the authorities because he thought that she might have been a spy, but he decided not to because he was afraid. And here's the picture. <gasps> oh, she's so cute. And it looks like the sketches. It really looks like her, especially if you zoom in. The side of her face really looks like that original sketch that the police put out. Yeah, the the pointed chin, the high cheekbones. Yeah. So the last part of this story are the theories. Obviously, the police theory is that she commits suicide. Mm -hmm. With all of the strange behavior and all of the clues, they think that she went up there, took a bunch of pills, and had some kind of accident with a fire. Uh, To me, the idea of her committing suicide just doesn't really add up. It doesn't. To me either. From the beginning, it didn't. The second theory is that she was a spy. This Mm -hmm. was during the Cold War. Because of the time period, a lot of people thought that she may have been a Russian spy. Mm -hmm. Which also kind of fits the idea of her being a fan of Beat Youth, who was from Russia and lived in Germany. Oh, yeah. And then the idea that this woman spoke German or maybe French you know it's just there's a lot at the time there was a secret military project happening and they were testing a missile that was called the penguin missile and it was being tested in Bergen and Stavanger in 1970 and some of her travels actually correlate with the missile testing dates oh wow that's kind of interesting this connection was made when a fisherman reported to have recognized her he was just like a fishing guy and he was on a like a boat dock thing where his fishing boat was at Mm -hmm. and he saw this beautiful exotic looking (laughs) woman walking on the boat docks and she was in nice fancy clothes Mm -hmm. and he was like what the heck and she went up to this military guy and she was like talking to him for like 15 to 20 minutes Wow! and the fisherman thought that it was really strange because he was just like what is she doing here like what kind of like woman looking like that yeah hot and fine why is she here you know like they were yeah just, he was just like, what? yeah it's like most of the people on the docks i'm assuming were like fishermen so they probably were like big beards and lumberjack clothes probably mm. and like big coats and they probably smelled mm. kind of stinky kind of fishy again with the military personnel exactly it's like there are multiple accounts of her interacting with military personnel so yeah. tells me everything i need to know i like had to look at, up this information because i had no idea what the cold war was mm-hmm. oh, it's like i'm sorry i Is went to me? public school but, and i figured that probably a lot of people that watch our videos don't know what it is either maybe <laughs> no offense if you do <laughs> but i just figured i should include this in there just to give a little more context and have a better understanding as to why she would be a russian spy you know yeah so yeah i'll go ahead and get into it and i'll try to explain it to the best of my ability but this is just the information that i found online so yeah let's get into it let's get into it so the cold war had been going on since 1945 and norway shared a border with the soviet union like they're directly next to each other Mm -hmm. germany attacked norway in 1940 during world war ii which was when like hitler was in rule Mm -hmm. and stuff Mm -hmm. and despite norway choosing to stay neutral with all of it Mm -hmm. they attacked norway anyway and during the war the soviet union fought against germany Mm -hmm. but when world war ii ended tension between the U.S. and the Soviet Union resurfaced. Basically, Mm. the U.S. was like, the Soviet Union, they're communists, and (laughs) they weren't cool with that, and they were just, like, worried about it, and it was, like, super intense, and they were just like, da-da-da. They thought that Stalin wasn't any better than Hitler, and Mm. Russia was like, okay, like, the U.S. literally didn't show up to the war on time, World War II, which Mm. indirectly led to the deaths of millions of Russians, so Mm. basically, they just had beef. Basically, the U.S. was like, yeah, we need to stop communism and then that's when NATO was born that stands for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and that was created basically to make it so that Europe and the US would partner up in case like communism resurfaced I guess oh okay. in case communism caused violence then they would partner up and be like we're gonna fight the war against you then I don't know okay they basically had an alliance with Norway at this time mm-hmm. because Norway decided to join NATO, basically mm-hmm. taking a side against the Soviet Union, mm-hmm. which was kind of difficult because they shared a border with the Soviet Union. They did it to protect themselves and yeah. 
the US was actually using an airbase in Norway to fly over the Soviet Union and spy. Oh my god. Yeah, so during that time, the Istal woman was in Bergen, the city that was host to one of the biggest naval bases, and it was really common for NATO to use the base. So it makes sense that she would be a Russian spy, maybe tracking the movements of the US government and, you know, Norway and NATO, and just maybe she was like getting involved in. Does that kind of make yeah. sense? There's yeah, like a correlation sense. there. Yeah. So that's why people kind of assumed oh, that she wow. would be a Russian spy was because of that. Thank you for explaining that because honestly, I had no idea what the freaking Cold War was. Yeah, same. I was like, I don't know what that is. So I'm <laughs> Think, just Yeah, definitely important to include. Yeah, and I feel like it makes it easier to understand because it's just like, why would why you just Russian? assume that she's a Russian spy? Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. And a crime reporter wrote about this story in 1970 and he said that the secret police was involved, but they actually denied their involvement until 2000 and then they came out and said that they were involved. Oh, how convenient. So I think that's, I think the secret police are kind of like the FBI, but in Norway. Oh, okay. That kind of just adds to the fact that maybe she was a spy and somebody was trying to cover up this case. It's like maybe like um, somebody found out that she was a Russian spy and they were like, we need to get rid of her. We don't want Russia to know that we killed her. So we're going to cover up her murder kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Just to wrap it all up, this the reason why I was so drawn to this case is because it's just a huge cold case. There's so many questions, (sighs) so many unanswered questions. You know, I feel like there's a lot of information that I'm really intrigued by. Yeah. And when I was studying it, I was just like, maybe she was a spy. Labels and tags being removed is not a new thing. Like, it's been happening mm. for a long time. So I figured I would add a couple little stories just to add to this story that have to do with labels being removed. Here are some cases that are really similar. And I would recommend looking these cases up because this doesn't include all of the information. On December 1st in 1948, so well before the East Doll woman, mm-hmm. the police were contacted after the body of a man was discovered on Somerton Park Beach in Australia. So this was in Australia, like a ways away. Yeah. But this man was found lying in the sand and he was lying like back with his head resting against a seawall, which I think is like a rock. Oh, okay. And his legs um, extended and his feet were crossed. And it was believed that the man had just died while sleeping. Later, the police decided to look into it and eventually they concluded that it was probably just suicide, Mm. which is a similarity to our story here. Yeah. And um, the coroner actually said, I am quite convinced the death could not have been natural. The poison I suggested was a barbiturate or a soluble hypnotic. And other than that, the coroner was unable to reach a conclusion as to the man's identity or his cause of death. All identifying marks and labels had been removed from his clothes on his body. And he didn't have a hat, which was really uncommon for this era, like 1940s and 50s. And then on May 31st, 1995, so well after the East Stall woman, a woman who went by the name Jennifer Fairgate checked into room 2805 of the Oslo Plaza Hotel in Norway, and three days later, she was found dead in her hotel room. While immediate observations suggested that she may have died by suicide, once again, Mm -hmm. evidence suggests that it was likely a murder. She was shot in the head. Ooh. All identifying labels had been removed from her clothes on her body, and all of the other clothing she had with her. And then this is the last one on June 16th, 2009, which is super recent. Yeah. The body of an unidentified man was discovered on the beach in Sligo, Ireland, and it was concluded that he had died of cardiac arrest. Despite conducting a five-month investigation into his death, the police have never been able to identify this man or develop any kind of leads in the case. The only difference in this case was that the labels on his clothing hadn't been removed. However, it hasn't helped the police anymore because the clothes that he did have on his body were from really popular brands. That is the end of our case today oh. lots of twists and turns and lots of mystery i oh, loved it one. i think you did a great job so well researched i love the way you tell a story Thank i you. think you did amazing yeah. if you guys were interested in this story i would highly recommend watching death in oslo it's a part of the unsolved mystery series on netflix also i would recommend listening to the podcast a death in ice valley which has a lot of information regarding this case that we talked about today in the east all woman but yeah i hope you guys enjoyed give us a like and subscribe and maybe write a little comment yeah maybe, maybe write a little comment anyways thank you so much for watching listening sitting with us All right, bye guys. Bye.